my earliest recollection of going underground with my dad was probably about 10 or 11 years old. <gasps> and he put a, a mine pad on and a, a lamp and a self-rescuer and off we trundled down probably a kilometre, a kilometre and a half underground in a coal mine. The hat so, wouldn't have even fit your head, would it? No, no, <laughs> the hat. I can remember put a pair of his socks in my hat. We've talked before about my dad. Now, one of the things that happened after I got hurt was my dad cashed in all of his holiday pay and all of his long service leave. And he sat in hospital pretty much for the whole three months that I was in hospital. Mm. That's a that's a huge effort on his part because he had my mum and five other kids to support and look after. Welcome to the Beers with a Minor podcast. My name is Mad Mumsy and I've been driving the huge dump trucks in Australian open cup mines for over 10 years now. I wish I had a dollar for everyone who said to me, how does a little thing like you drive those big trucks? Oh, you must be rich. How do I get a job doing that? My mining friends are asked these questions all the time too. This is what started the Mad Mumsy journey to share stories and tips from living a mining lifestyle and to let others know what it's really like. Tune in each episode as I sit down for a relaxed chat, usually over a few beers with a fellow miner. Women and blokes with various experience, roles and opinions share their lessons and stories with you. Not everyone is cut out to be a miner, but why not? What does it take to thrive and survive in this industry? Now, let's dig in. Get it? Dig? Mining? I oh, crack me up. Hello and welcome to episode 69 of the Beers with a Miner podcast. My name is Mad Mumsy and in this happy hour chat, I talk with James Wood, also known as Woody, the safety bloke. You might have had Woody come to your site and talk to your crew, or perhaps you've seen his videos on YouTube. Listen in as we uncover his mining story together and how he ended up in a wheelchair because of some choices he made when he was at work one day. I really enjoyed hanging out with Woody, and once again, I've made a new friend with someone that I interviewed on the podcast. I'm sure you'll get a lot from this conversation, not just for his thoughts on mining life, safety culture and choices we make but because he's a great bloke and we have lots of fun in between the serious sides of his message enjoy today in this happy hour episode we are talking with james wood also known as woody the safety bloke welcome to the podcast james or woody you'd prefer Thank you, Leanne, or Mumsy, whatever you prefer. <laughs> Either or. I used to hide behind Mad Mumsy for a long time and then my mum started yeah. calling me Leanne when I interviewed her and saying, oh, sorry. <laughs> I have one very important question to ask you, which I ask all my guests at the start of our interview. As this podcast is called the Beers with a Minor podcast, I like to start these happy hour episodes with my guests sharing their favourite beverage and also, also their favourite time to enjoy it. It could be beer, wine, spirit, or perhaps even a cup of tea. What is yours, Woody? Well, I have to admit, Mumsy, that I'm a beer drinker. I think I had my first beer when I was about 15 and that was it. Uh, Over the years, I've tried, you know, different things. You know, we all have a a wine occasionally or a spirit, but no, I'm I'm a true and true beer drinker. Love it. We've been really lucky as beer drinkers over the last few years with all the, you know, the, the influx of all the new craft beers and, you know, microbreweries. So, you know, I, my first beer was a, and I don't know if you can do brands on this podcast, but it was a, a Tui's draft or a Tui's new. And uh, I've, I've pretty well stuck with that my whole life. It's just, you know, it's a beer that I know the taste of. I can rely on it wherever I can find it. And, uh, yeah, that's that's my tipple of choice. And do you prefer a stubby can or a pot or a stinger, a jug? <laughs> depending depending on where I am, I like beer out of a glass. So I'm always a you know a, a stubby holder, a stubby sort of drinker. Um, but you know, in the colder climates, I don't mind using a can as well. So I think the second part of your question is when do I like to have a beer and I think this is a you know a, a, a fairly Australian thing is after work, 
you know, there's nothing better than doing a, a decent day's work, whatever it is, you know, it doesn't matter where you work and what you do. And at the end of that day, just to crack open a cold beer, it's just like, oh, that's it. It's a, it's more of a, a sign that the day's done and, you know, you can, you can start to wind down. Did you have a beer after night shift? Did you used to do night shifts or any time? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I used to do night shift. Again, uh, probably not as many after a night shift as you would, you know, after a, a day shift or at the end of a, a swing. But, you know, it was, again, it's that, you know, that reward and that satisfaction of knowing yeah, that the day is done. I totally agree. All right. So let's dig in to this episode. Get it? Dig? Mining? <laughs> Ah, correct me up. Yeah. So, Woody, would you like to share how you first got to start in the mines and what it was that you were doing? Absolutely. Okay. Well, I'm uh, I'm a miner through and through. Um, I come from a mining family. Um, I'm Scottish, mumsy. So, I my dad was in the mining industry over in Scotland, coal miner, and his father and his grandfather were also coal miners. So in the uh, the early 70s, my dad packed us all up onto a, a plane and we emigrated to Australia, and uh, that was uh, that was that was our start in the mining industry in Australia. Dad got a job as a dad was a deputy, so you know in an underground coal mine. So my first uh, experience with mining was one of the the things that my dad used to do was on a weekend this this mine site this underground mine site was in a little country town in New South Wales and it only worked Monday to Friday so it shut down for the weekend that's like a real job Woody (laughs) it's like a real job yeah so anyhow one the, the the deputies used to have to keep an eye on the gas levels in the mine so they used to take it in turns you know at every I think it was every third weekend uh, my dad had to go out to the mine, I think at least once a day on the weekend, go underground, take some gas readings and then come back up to the, the surface. So I think my earliest recollection of going underground with my dad was probably about 10 or 11 years old. <gasps> and he put a, a, a mine uh, hat on and a, a lamp and a self-rescuer and off we trundle down, you know, probably a kilometre, a kilometre and a half underground in a coal mine. And I, I still smile when I think of those memories. Yeah, that's right. Like it wouldn't, unheard of nowadays, just wouldn't happen. No, no. The hat no. wouldn't have even fit your head, would it? No, no, <laughs> the hat. I can remember um, he put a pair of his socks in my hat to yeah. make it, you know, so it wouldn't drop down over the front of my, my face. So it was, uh, yeah, it was quite funny. What did your mum think of him taking you down underground? Yeah, look, I, I, I mean, I'm from a, a fairly large family, you know, uh, probably no TV when my mum and dad got married. So it was <laughs> six kids in our family, uh, two boys and four girls. And, yeah, I think it was just part of, of, of life, you know. She, my dad used to say, all right, I'm taking the boys out to the pit, call it the pit, and uh, that was it. She didn't have a say in it. So did he take you all, all six of you? No, no, just the two boys. It was just the two boys. I think occasionally he took a couple of my older sisters, but the two youngest ones were just babies at the time, so he wouldn't have taken them. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. but you know, the, the really funny thing, and this is something I look back on fondly, is that my dad used to try and explain to me as a 10, 11-year-old how a mine worked. <laughs> um. I, I don't know if you know much about underground mining, uh, Mumsy, but they're they're living, breathing things. You know, they 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 work a lot on ventilation, and they they have to uh, you know have the right amount of airflow in the right areas. So you know, my dad's trying to explain all of this to me as a as a ten, eleven year old, and and you know, a lot of it went straight over my head, but I still remember him. You know, the the way he used to try and talk to us about it. It's funny. I was um, yeah. I- I do, I'm learning more about underground as I interview mm-hmm. people like you, and I have had a mm-hmm. deputy on as well, um, yep. Buck in Buchanan. He wrote yep. a book called Coal Faces, and oh, yeah. uh, my partner's an underground miner. He's a fitter, okay. so of course, you know, yeah. the in thing that the thing that um, my listeners know is he's a real miner because they go yes. underground. You know, okay. we're yeah. landscape gardeners, sunshine yeah. miners. You know, all the things. Um, 
But I was going to say to you back in the day when he was trying to explain it to you, there was no social media, no, let's go on YouTube, lad, and watch it. But he took you there. (laughs) So you were actually in there. So was he pointing out the ventilation? Yep. Um, Yeah. He was was taking me behind, um, you know, we they they have, they block off different, uh, you know, passages with with bratis, like a, a plastic sheet, just to get the airflow. And then what he would do is he would say, look, stand this side of the, the, the bratis wall and can you feel the air flowing past your face? And then he'd say, right, go the other side of it and there would be no airflow. Mm. He said, that's, you know, that's he's just trying to explain to me that this is the way they, they channel the air and, and make sure the mind works and breathes. Wow. So that's that good. That's good. Thanks for sharing yeah. that with us. Yeah. And then leading on from there, I left school at 15, um, you know, typical uh, mining town and in that uh, your choices were fairly limited. There was two coal mines in that uh, little country town and there was an abattoir. So you either went to work at the abattoir and, you know, kill sheep and cows and pigs or you, if you were lucky enough, you, uh, you got a job at one of the mines. And uh, I left school at 15 and I got an apprenticeship as a fitter. So I can relate to your partner. <laughs> uh, and again, I, I think I was really fortunate because I got into the mining industry in the late 70s, early 80s. And uh, that was when we actually, uh, and I know, you know, a lot of your listeners are going to argue, a lot, especially a lot of fitters are going to argue with me about this, when we actually repaired things and fixed things and kept things going uh because we had to you know today i think fitters i've got a i've got a son who's a diesel mechanic and his job is basically pulling an old part off and putting a new part on and we have a lot of uh discussions about you know the way that i used to do it and the way that he does it now I can imagine, oh, back in the day, son, we yeah, did it yeah. with one arm tied behind our back and no, you know, yeah. yeah. This is how I used to do it. <laughs> yeah. See, it, it's changed, hasn't it? A lot A lot has changed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah a lot, lot's changed in mining. And I, I've been really lucky that I've been involved in the industry through those changes. And I, I, I think that I'm very fortunate to have, you know, to, to have seen the changes in mining over the last 30 nearly 40 years Mm. so did you stay as a fitter underground yeah I stayed as a fitter I finished my apprenticeship as a fitter and then the the coal mine that I was working for uh closed down the Mm. price of getting coal from the mine to the port they were making you know next to nothing on it you know which is typical of, of our industries um, so, uh, they offered me a transfer to one of their, this, this mine site was owned by, you know, one of the bigger companies and they offered us a, or well, a couple of us a transfer to one of their open cut pits down in the Hunter Valley. Yeah. So I, I said, <laughs> yeah. so I said, okay, you know, I've got nothing to lose. I was sort of in my, my late teens. I thought, yeah, I'm going to move down and, you know, live, uh, with one of the other guys that you know moved down from the the town that we were living in so we we organized a, a flat together and uh yeah it was like uh it was party central it was pretty good <laughs> and how did you find the difference between working uh, as a sunshine miner or what did you call it because I've interviewed two who had to go through that ta- transition who I had to work yeah. with and um, yeah. they saw themselves as basically council workers but getting paid more money and it's not real mining and bring back, you know, and the team underground was a lot smaller than the crew. So they didn't feel as connected. Yeah. I probably didn't notice the changes as much. I was I was sort of caught up in the 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 excitement of being, you know, only a teenager still, mm. um, moving away from home. That was another big thing for me. You know, I'd, I'd live with my parents up until this t- time, uh, you know, got to live in a, a flat with another guy and, uh, you know, that was pretty exciting, but yeah, the, 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 the actual work was not that much different. Um, you know, we, we had a lot better equipment at the open cut pit. But, uh, you know, it was still digging that black stuff out of the ground and chucking it on trains. Yeah. 
And uh, what rosters were you doing then? Okay, we did, uh, a, a, well, when I tell people this, they, they say, no, nah, that can't be right. We did seven-hour shifts. So there was, there was three, three seven-hour shifts during the day and there was an overlap where it was covered by overtime. So it was pretty much guaranteed overtime. And, you know, it was rotating shifts. So you do a week of days, a week of nights, and then a week of afternoon shift. Afternoon shift was great. It was sort of 2 o'clock in the afternoon till about 11 o'clock at night. It was just perfect. Mm. And then you could go out and party and then sleep all then morning, you get rid of your hangover, get back to zero. And Although they probably, did they test back then? No. 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 Yeah. I, I, I can't recall, you know, when I was in the industry, and again, this is the 70s and 80s before I, you know, had my accident, and I'm sure we'll talk about that later. Yes. But, um yes. In the in the early years in mining, there was yeah there was there was not uh, a great deal of you know, drug and alcohol testing, um, and it was a, a fairly hard working, hard drinking uh, environment. Things have changed a lot since then. Certainly have, haven't they? Including mm. the rosters. So you were you still there when they changed rosters to twelve hour rosters and all that, or were you still no. doing the seven hours no. we're still doing the the seven hour shifts and it was just it was yeah it was actually quite cruisy uh, a lot of miners back then had second jobs you know they would actually not and not so much for the money just because they had so much time on their hands mm. they had either second jobs or they owned a small business that they could spend a fair bit of time in you know when they weren't at work yeah which is good well i guess a lot of people I know do that because with the even time roster, week on, week off, not yeah. so much. Oh, a few people have got a second job, but more the mm. um, setting up a business. Yes. You know, or they've got a, a digger and a truck and they go and do a few things on break and mm. get the bobcat out or, yep. or whatever, um, which is a good way to be too because you're kind of setting yourself up yeah. for exiting mining because you never know when yes. that might be forced on you one way or another yeah. economically or yeah. anything so um so how long were you actually all up how many years did you do uh, i did about seven years in mining so I started when i was 15 i had my accident in my early 20s yeah yeah uh, yeah so and i look had it had i not have, and i know we'll talk about the accident in a minute but had i not have had the accident lee and i i think i Pretty well guarantee I'd still be working on a mine site somewhere. Because you it's enjoyed it that much? I think so, yeah. 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 I, I still enjoy it. I still, even though I don't work in mining as such, I work a lot with the mining industry and I, I love it. I love the, uh, you know, the, the industry as yeah. a whole. And, and the culture of it and too. The culture. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's great. I love it. I love it too. And um, mm. my listeners know that I've stepped away from actively working as a miner these days. Yep. I talk about it all the time, <laughs> which is great. Um, but I miss that crew culture and yeah. mm. your other family, you know, we'll have yeah. the odd phone call or like JS. Yeah. Hey, JS, my number one yeah. fan. He mm. listens in his truck downloads the latest episode when he's on break and then puts it in the USB and mm. listens in his truck. And oh, occasionally cool. he'll give me a ring and check in or my crew will send me pictures of the great sunrise or sunset because I always used to make them look at it. <laughs> yeah. You know, call up on the two-way and say, check out, check yeah. that out to the dozer driver and they're like, what? Look at that sunrise. Oh, God, oh, you know, like, <laughs> crazy woman. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I find that I miss it. And I've, I know that I've spoken to other people and um, it's a big part. Of it, so I guess with you still going back to the mines, although you don't have your own crew, you're you're still in touch, which yeah, yeah we'll yeah. we'll get to. So, all right then, would you like to share with my listeners what happened next, Woody? Yeah, okay. So things were pretty cruisy, you know. I um had a good job. I'd finished my apprenticeship, you know, a good car, a couple of motorbikes, you know, working in mining seven hour shifts. Uh, it was just, you know, life was pretty good. Now, uh, I had a weekend off and, uh, it was a Monday morning. I woke up to go to work just like any other Monday morning. 
Um, hadn't had a really big weekend. Uh, did a couple of, you know, fairly long motorbike rides. So, you know, I was keen to get to work and catch up with my, my crew and, you know, talk about what we all did over the weekend. Anyhow, um, the first job for the shift, uh, the boss said to me that a, a truck had broken down on the, the site. We had, a, we had a little service cart and it used to run around and fill up all the generators and lighting plants with fuel and oil. And the, uh, the power steering belt had snapped on the service truck. Now, I used to fix fan belts all the time. So when the boss gave me the job this day, straight away I thought, oh, yeah, I can do that. You know, I've, I've done that before. Um, I didn't do any sort of, probably important to point out, Leander, I didn't do any sort of job plan or risk assessment. Um, take five, you heard of take five? Take five, slams, all the, yes, most different mining companies have a have a brand of it, yeah. Well, we used, we used take five and we had the, the take five system in place. So I had a little take five booklet in my pocket Can and I, we were meant to be. Can yeah. I just interrupt there? That's interesting that. They had that at least back yeah, back then. They yeah. didn't have drug it testing was, and alcohol. No, but you had to think about it before you were meant to. Yeah. yeah. Did they enforce? Um, it was only a new thing. It was only a new thing. Like uh, we'd, yeah. we'd had it. I think we'd had it on site for probably twelve months or eighteen months. And I think the first probably three to six months they were really hard on us, saying like, "Have you done your take fives? Have you done your take fives?" But after, you know, after a period of time, that sort of wore off. You know, they weren't asking us if we'd done them as, as often and we weren't doing them as often. So anyhow, because it was a job that I'd done hundreds of times before, I thought, oh, yeah, I can, I can just jump straight into it. So I didn't do a take five. I didn't think about how I was going to do the job. Now, the next thing that he, he said to me, he said, oh, look, when you finish fixing that, that vehicle, take it back up to the parking bay so the operator can pick it up, use it for the rest of the shift. Now, I could actually see where I had to go. The parking bay was only a, a short distance away. So I, I thought I was only going to be in the, the vehicle for a, a couple of minutes at the most. So I, um, I fixed the truck, put a new belt on the truck. That was easy. Jumped up into the cabin. Just as I got into the cabin that day, I had a look at the time. Now, I noticed it was five to nine in the morning. Smoko was at nine o'clock or crib was at nine o'clock. So straight away, I thought, oh, beauty, if I can get back to the crib room by nine o'clock, I can catch up with the boys and the girls. Uh, there was only two girls on our, our crew. Um, so I took off down the road in the truck uh, in a bit of a hurry, put my foot down, uh, going a little bit too quick for the, for the conditions. I lost control of the truck. Uh, wet road, we'd had a bit of rain around that day. So wet, slippery road, I'm going too fast. I ended up rolling down the side of a, a hill oh, three sorry. times. They worked, they worked out that I rolled it three times. Wow. I got thrown out of the cabin and I broke my back. Mm. Uh, snapped my back, damaged my spinal cord. Now, the reason when I tell people what happened to me, Mumsy, um, when I go out and, and share my story at a, a mine site or a workplace, one of the things that I, I tell people is that I, I reckon the reason I got thrown out of the truck that day, I wasn't held in. Mm. The, uh, the truck had seat belts in it. I didn't have a, a seat belt on. Yeah. So the, uh, the choices that I made caused me to end up in a wheelchair for the for the rest of my life and that was the uh that was the end of my my career working on a mine site now i just work with mining companies wow what a and i knew the story yep and i know a lot of my listeners would also know the story but to sit here mm. we're on video link i haven't seen yep. your presentation but mm. to feel the energy of you reliving that um, it d just gives you goosebumps, and I know yeah. lots of people that don't wear seatbelts out there. Yeah, I used to mm -hmm. pride myself on it, um, mm -hmm. and everyone should. And these are the sort of reasons, the yeah. reasons why. Well, I'll just give you another reason why. The uh, the next thing that I can remember is I was lying on the ground outside the the vehicle, mm -hmm. and I looked up, and I, I could see the whole cabin of the vehicle 
Now the cabin was in really good shape. It wasn't wasn't crushed flat. You know, it didn't blow up. You know, like you see on the movies. Yeah, it uh, wasn't on fire. The uh, the windscreen was still in the in the cabin. So that gives you an idea of the shape of that shell. Mm-hmm. So I suppose the the point that I'm trying to make there is that I, I reckon if I would have jumped into that truck that day and just reached up, pulled it down, clipped it in, I don't know what two seconds, three seconds, I would have been held inside the the cabin. I wouldn't have got thrown out, and I uh, I don't think we'd be talking today, Mumsy. I think I'd uh, mm. I'd probably still be working on a mine site somewhere. That's right. But do you think that that young person back then might have made another choice similar down the track that could have done something else? That yeah, you know, that's a good question. You know, one of the things that I try not to do, uh, and I think this helps me cope with with life in this situation is. I don't, I don't really compare what could have been if I hadn't have had my accident that day. Mm. I think the way that, you know, I deal with the fact that I'm, I'm in a wheelchair, I've been in a wheelchair for the last 30 years and I'll probably be in a wheelchair for the next 30 years, is just by accepting that this is the, you know, this is the situation that I, I'm in. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't sort of, I mean, I, don't get me wrong, I, 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 I wish that it hadn't happened. I wish that I didn't have to get around in a wheelchair. Well, that's but, natural, isn't uh, it? It'd have to yeah. be. Yeah. But there's nothing I can do about it, so I've just got to cope with the situation that I'm in. Yeah. Great attitude to have. Yeah. How long did it take you to end up feeling like that? Like how were you in the initial um, early stages of that as what were yeah. you? How old? 22? 22, yeah, mm. yeah. So, okay, um, obviously whenever something traumatic happens to anybody, you know, we, we all deal with it in different ways. Uh, I was pretty negative and pretty angry and pretty frustrated. Um, a couple of things uh, changed my, uh, my way of looking at my situation. Um, uh, we've talked before about my dad. Now, one of the things that happened after I got hurt was my dad cashed in all of his holiday pay and all of his long service leave. And he sat in hospital pretty much for the whole three months that I was in hospital. Mm. So that's, 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 a, that's a huge effort on his part because he had my mum and five other kids to support and look after. Mm. But you know what? He, he wanted to be there for me. And he was the one constant thing that I could always rely on. Like there was different doctors, different nurses, different tests, different procedures. But I knew that my dad was always going to be there. Anyhow, a, a couple of things happened, Mumsy. Um, I was I was whinging and complaining about, you know, all of the things that I was going to miss out on. You know, every opportunity, you know, workmates had come in, friends had come in, and I'd go, well, I'm not going to be able to ride my motorbike anymore. I'm not mm. going to be able to climb a ladder. I'm not going to be able to do this, do that. And you know, my old man, he probably picked up on a little bit of this. And, and one day it was just me and him sitting in the, in the room. And he, um, I, I just started. I said, oh, but Dad, I'm not going to be able to, I can't remember what I said to him, I'm not going to be able to climb on the roof or something like that. You know, and he, he looked at me and he said, wake up to yourself. I go, what? He says, you're never going to be able to get on with your life worrying and thinking about what you can't do anymore. He said, what you've got to do is look at what you still can do and make the most of it. And I hated him at the time. I thought, you mongrel. You got no idea what I'm going through. But it, it, it was he planted that seed that, mm. you know, you know, I, I should be focusing on what I still can do rather than what I can't do. So that's that's one of the things that my old man sorted me out on and how did you feel when you finally came out of hospital was he by your side I yeah he was I... there he was there and uh yeah he was he was there when I, I got out of hospital but the, see the hospital thing was just the start of it yeah. the hospital is just taking care of any medical procedures or you know things that they can they can give you after I got out of hospital they they said to me that I needed to go to what they call rehab or rehabilitation. Now, when I when I share my story out at mine sites and, and workplaces, one of the the way I describe rehab is I, I pretty much had to learn how to live all over again. 
Mm. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I used to be able to do, I just I can't do anymore. So I had to I had to learn how to get around using a wheelchair. I'd never even sat in a wheelchair before I got hurt. Um, I had to learn how to drive a car using hand controls. You know, I had to learn how to get dressed lying down on the floor or lying down on the bed. I mean, I, I can't stand up to get a pair of pants or a pair of jeans on. So, you know, that, that whole learning to live again process, that took six months. Mm. I went to one of those full-time living rehab centres and I stayed there for six months. So from the, the day that I got hurt to the time that I could pretty basically look after myself, it was nine months. And I've got to tell you, it was a... It was a pretty tough nine months. There was a lot of days that it felt like a, a lot longer than that. Oh, shit, yeah. Oh, by mm. the way, you're allowed to swear on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, wondering that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'll say, fuck in there, mate. Like, what a story. That, <laughs> what you had to go through, I mean, um, and you had brothers and sisters as well yeah. coming in, family. How did your mum yeah. handle it? I'm like, I'm the mum nana kind of energy yeah. <laughs> how did yeah. you, how did she yeah, go I, I think you know mum was uh her job after i got hurt was to keep the rest of the family together mm. so as much as you know i mean you, you being a mum you know as much as she probably wanted to do nothing more than just be there with me 24/7 she took on the role of, you know, making sure my brother and four sisters were, you know, were were not too impacted by what had happened to me. Yeah. And I think I think that's where one of the ways, I mean, you know, mum and dad were a typical mining family in that, you know, uh, they, they weren't sort of well educated. But I think the one thing that they did really well was, you know, make sure that dad was, you know, looking out for me and mum kept the rest of the family uh, supported and under control. Mm. So they, 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 I think they got through it really well. They did a really good job of it. It sounds like it. And you are a wonderful human. You're, you're a wonderful oh. human being and to have, have gone through all of that and, and then now you go out to mine sites and share your story. Mm. How, yeah. how did, um, how did that unfold? How did you start yeah. to do that? Okay, well, like... After uh, after hospital and rehab, um, mum and dad, they built on the back of their house uh, a whole new extension. They built a, a separate bathroom, separate bedroom, uh, ramp for my wheelchair to get in there, just to give me the option of going home. Yeah. But I'd, I'd, I'd been out of home for eight years. The last thing I wanted to do was go home and live with my parents. Mm. So um, I, I disappointed mum. I, I actually upset my mum by saying, nah, I'm not coming home. I, I want to, you know, try and live by myself. So um, I, I found a place to live. I, I'm, I thought the best option for me, Mumsy, would be a larger place. So a city, you know, more options, more opportunities. So I mistakenly moved down to Sydney in New South Wales. And uh, you gotta, you got to keep in mind, I came from a, I grew up in a, a mining town of probably about four and a half, five thousand people. And then I ended up in a, a city in, uh, in, in New South Wales with millions of people. So yeah. it was a bit of a culture shock for me. And uh, I couldn't find anywhere to rent. This is, this is another little side story in that, Back in the, the sort of early 80s, people's perception of someone in a wheelchair or someone with any sort of disability was probably a little bit different. Mm. So I couldn't find a place to rent. I used to, I used to ring up the landlords, you know, get the local paper, ring up the landlords and say, look, can I come out and have a look at your flat? I'd make sure it was on the ground floor. And then I'd turn up in my wheelchair and they'd look at me and go, Nah, sorry, this flat's not suitable for you. Oh. And there was a couple, there was one landlord in particular. He looked straight at me and he said, "Nah, I don't want someone in a wheelchair living in my flat." Oh. So I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't find anywhere to live. The only place that I was offered was in public housing, mm. so housing commission uh, accommodation. Now, uh, no offence to to the you know public housing system, but they're usually not in the nicest parts of town. And they're usually, you know, in a, a, a pretty, I always say my, my flat was in the western suburbs of Sydney. 
I always say you never see a postcard of the western suburbs of Sydney, do you? <laughs> That's like for a short time I lived in the northern suburbs of Adelaide yeah. <laughs> and you never yeah. see postcards from there either, no. only no. Uh, no. serial killer murders and stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, similar similar type of environment. And, and I lived in a housing commission flat for about three, three and a half years. Now, um, a lot of people might think that that was probably not the best environment to live in, you know, straight after having a, a, a serious injury and, you know, three months in hospital, six months in, in rehab. But it was actually really good because it, it made me uh, do everything for myself. You know, washing, cleaning. Uh, my, you know, my car got broken into three times. I stopped replacing the car radio after the third time it got stolen. Oh. So you know, as, as much as those things sound, oh yeah, you know, that's pretty bad. It was, it was all, it was all culture building. Put it that way. <laughs> so I, I enjoyed it. And then uh, I got a, I got some pretty crappy jobs. Um, I think the other thing it's worth pointing out is that. After I got hurt, my opportunities in mining were pretty well wiped out. Yeah. You know, back when I got hurt, there was no, uh, you know, retraining or offer of alternative employment or alternative duties. It was pretty much you can't do the job that we employed you to do, so bad luck. Was there any compensation or anything from um, the mine? Because it was a workplace accident, but. Yes, yes and no. Um, it's it's one of those things where again I'd never dealt with lawyers or the legal mm. profession before, yeah. and I've got to tell you I hate them. <laughs> you know, and I mean this is their job. No no disrespect to to lawyers, but their job is to prove the other side wrong. But it just becomes a big shit fight between both sides. So you know, my my lawyer was saying, well, you know, you didn't train him properly. You didn't enforce him to do a take five. You didn't encourage him to wear a seatbelt. And then their side was saying, well, hang on a sec, you you know, you were going too fast, you didn't have a seatbelt on, you didn't do a take five. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, who wins out of that? Nobody. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the whole compensation thing was just, it was just crap. I, I was really disheartened by that. But, you know, the thing is it forced me to get back to work. Yeah. Um, one of the things, and this is probably worth mentioning too, one of the things that my I said to my lawyer, I said, well, you know, when and rehab and get back to work I said then I'll you know I'll be able to pay you a little bit more and he he turned around and said to me he says I would strongly advise you not to go back to work mm-hmm. because you know that will impact your compensation and I, I just said to him mumsy I said well mate I said if I don't get back to work you won't have a compensation case to worry about because I, I won't cope if I don't find yeah. a job so I had a, a fairly a fairly good work ethic and I uh, wanted to get back to work. But, um, yeah, just to answer your question about how I got into the, the speaking side of things, um, I li- whilst living in the Housing Commission flat, I had a whole heap of really, you know, crappy jobs. Um, my first job after the accident, I was working for a, an engine reconditioning company and I had a big bag of rags and a wire brush and I was cleaning dirty engine parts for eight or nine hours a day. But at least at least it was a job. So anyhow, um, then I can't remember how long it was after I got hurt, but I had a phone call from one of my mates, one of the boys that still worked in mining, and he had made it up into a, a superintendent's role or a, a you know management position. And one of his you know responsibilities was for safety. And I don't know why he did this, but he he rang me up this day and he said, oh, Woody, his his exact words were, Woody, we're having this safety bullshit day. (laughs) Oh, Oh my God. (laughs) Sounds like a superintendent, I might say. Sounds like a superintendent. (laughs) He says, we're having this safety bullshit day. I reckon you should come out and tell people what happened to you. And I, I, I told him, get stuffed. I said, there is no way that I'm going to sit in front of a group of people especially a group of miners Mm. and talk about my accident anyhow he was one of those annoying pricks of mates that we've all got you know (laughs) and he kept nagging me and he he, I can remember one time we were having a couple of beers and he said to me he said well if someone had turned up at our site is this the sort of thing that you would have listened to 
And something just clicked. I thought, you know what? I would have, I would have liked to have heard somebody else's story. You know, not, not just being told to do something by my safety people, by my manager, by my, you know, my foreman. But if I could, if I could see the results of someone getting hurt, or if I'd heard it firsthand from someone that had, that actually experienced it, I thought, you know, I, I would have listened to that. So I agreed to go out and speak at his, uh, his safety day, and it just, it just snowballed from there. Wow! And now you have company yeah. business that has other speakers as well. Yeah, yeah which I want to touch on, but just take mm. me back because. I I love talking, but I'm more I like this kind of person. Get me in a crowd and my palms are sweaty and in front of a crowd, you know, but I'm working towards doing more of that. Um, yeah. And these are minors that you don't know. You, yeah. did you, you didn't know them. What did you just go no, no. To in, a, in a big room? How many were there? Yep. Uh, I think there's about probably about, there was one crew, so there's probably about 35, 40 people. Yeah. And they're yeah. sitting there going, oh, yeah, what's this about? Another safety bullshit thing we have to do? Yeah, probably, exactly. As I mean, as soon as you mention the word safety to most people that work in mining, it's automatically, oh, here we go, more safety bullshit. Mm. Because that, you know, I mean, that is a lot of people's perception of what safety is all about. But I think part of the, you know, especially in the later years that I've been sharing my story, I, I try and change people's views on what safety is all about. It's all about going out that gate at the end of the the day or the end of the swing and uh yeah just so the the the, the first talk um and i went into the room absolutely shitting myself uh heart rate going crazy you know thinking oh i don't think i can do this how did i and get I, into this position yeah. how did this happen <laughs> but i i think the good thing was um i I sort of started sharing my story and then I asked people if they had any questions. And once people started asking me questions, I was able to answer the questions. So, you know, that got me through it, the, the first one. And then I thought, I kept, okay, so that was the first one. And I thought, right, thank Christ for that. I'll never have to do that again. <laughs> and, uh, but after, after I did that talk, I think it wasn't the next day, but the day after, the phone rang. Um, this is before mobile phones, by the way. Mm, so the phone know. rang in my, yeah, the phone rang and I, this, this guy was on the other end. He says, oh, he says, is this James Wood? And I said, yeah. He said, mate, he says, I heard you uh, went out to such and such a mine site the other day and did a talk. I said, he said, uh, can you come out to our mine and do the same thing? And I said, nah, I don't do that. I said, I just... <laughs> I said, I just did it for a, for a mate of mine. And he said, no, he said, look, I'm serious. I said, it, it had a really, apparently it went over really well at their site. So I'd like you to do the same thing for our site. So anyhow, I, I didn't give him an answer straight away. I said, look, I'm going to have to think about it. I said, because I didn't, I didn't cope real well with it. I said, so let me get back to you. And I hung up the phone and, and I started thinking about it. And, you know, I had his number there. And I, I don't know when it was, but I, I, I thought to myself either sometime that day or the day after, I thought, well, there's obviously a demand for this type of information. So I agreed to go out to his side as well. And, and then it just sort of kept going from there. So those first... 20-something 20, 20 years later, I'm still doing it. Still doing it. Those first few times were volunteer... Times, yeah, 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 pretty much. It was just, yeah, just I'll turn up, you know, share my story and go, go, go away again. Yeah, and then I actually had someone offer to pay me for it. And I, I, <laughs> firstly, I said, Oh, no, you're right, you don't have to pay me for it. But then I, I, I realized that, you know, it, it is a fairly valuable, uh, it, it's, it's quite, you know, valuable to a company if I can stop one of their people from getting hurt. So I thought, well, why not? You know, I might, you know, see if I can accept some some money for it. And then uh, from there, it was it was a part time thing. You know, it was like I was doing a talk every probably maybe once a month or once every two months. And then you know, the more that I did, the more momentum it gained, and now it's uh, it's my uh, my full time gig. I think to the value that because um, that's what Drewy does. Hard yeah. hat mentor, my sister, to my listeners, they know her. You know, um, 
a leadership and cultural coach. I never get it right, mm. but you know, she helps mm. helps people to understand the why about getting people to do things safely so we can all get out out the gate at the end of the day. And um, there's many ways to start getting crews to do that. But just going back to your seatbelt message for one, over the years mm. I've seen a lot of people, especially as technology has improved in the seats, the truck or the, the grader or loader, whatever you're in, knows that you haven't put the seatbelt on. And so the yeah. alarm goes off. So people yeah. get very innovative, these people that okay. don't, well, I like seatbelts. I don't do seatbelts. Um, yeah. And they plug it in and then hmm. sit in front of the seatbelt or yeah. they'll just put it over so it looks like it is when anyone drives past and then let it go. Yeah. And so yeah. many different variations of how to not wear a seatbelt and get away with it. And then someone like yeah. you comes and speaks to the crew like it, mm. it really has to start working at their heart and yeah. um, then they might start, have you heard that they start thinking about other safety things that they might also start? Because they wearing your PPE in general but wearing your glasses, getting people to yeah. wear their glasses. I've always had crappy, shitty eyes, allergy, mm. bed rims, you know, like just pathetic, black circles under the, I've always had eye issues. So if I'm in a dusty environment, I'm wearing my glasses because it's looking after my eyes, yeah. not because yeah. I don't get in trouble, but, God, the safety weirdo's coming, you know. Um, so that's what I'm trying to say. Do you also talk yeah. about that kind of thing yeah. as well? I do. See, my, my, whole, my whole message is all about choices. I say that I made some wrong choices. And as much as, you know, we've talked a fair bit about seatbelts, seatbelt wasn't just, wasn't the only mm. choice that caused me to get hurt. Um, the three things that I say caused me to get hurt are I didn't think about the job. You know, we had the system in place. We had the take five system. Um, had I have done a take five that day, I'll, t- I'll tell you a, a little story, Mumsy. One of the things that happened after I got hurt was one of the boys from the mine site, he brought down some of my my gear that was in my locker. So anyhow, he brought down some boots and clothes and uh, a couple of books. And one of the things he brought down was some of my old Take 5 books because, you know, the Take 5 books, you you fill them in and then you get a new one and you fill them in and you just chuck them in your, in your locker. Mm. So I had about three or four of these Take 5 books that had all been, you know, filled out and one night I woke up oh, probably three o'clock in the morning couldn't sleep whole heap of pain um reached over to my bedside table and I grabbed these take five books and you know, I'm flicking through old jobs that I've done over the years you know looking at you know I fixed a dozer on such and such a day I did this I did that anyhow I got to a blank take five and I don't know why I did this, but I decided to do a take five for the job that I got hurt on. <gasps> now, yeah, Powerful. had I have done a take, had I have done a take five that day, and done one properly, not just gone tick 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 to mm. cover my ass. Yeah. But if I'd done a take five and done one properly, I would have identified probably three or four different things that could have stopped me from getting hurt. So you know, we had the system in place, but I didn't use it. So, you know, that's the first choice that I, I, I that caused me to get hurt. The second thing that, that, you know, that I did was I was driving too quick for the conditions. You know, I was, I was going down that road. Uh, you know, I, was, I reckon I was probably only doing probably 55, 60 kilometres an hour, but I probably should have only been doing 20 mm. or 25 kilometres an hour. I was going to so, say, you know, in, a, driving, yeah, in a service car yeah. on a wet, road yep. at the mines yep. yeah that's yeah that's fast that's, that's pretty quick yeah <laughs> and the, so driving too quick I mean we're always being told drive to the conditions yeah. here's a here's a perfect example or I'm a perfect example of of not driving to the conditions mm. and then again the third part of it is I didn't protect myself you know the truck had seat belts in it I didn't use it so you know those three things you can apply those three things to any role on a mine site or any role in most workplaces you know, think about what you're doing. Don't take a risk and protect yourself. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, that's my that's my story. Choices. That's what caused me to get hurt. And it it's such a good message for especially my listeners who are yet to 
go through the joys of all the safety talks and all the procedures and all of the things, if, if you just take those three things in, yeah. especially from this conversation, but take yeah. it inside your heart and don't, do yeah. it, you know, like I t- I've shared a story um, on the podcast before. I'll just quickly share it with you. Um, there were three of us trucks, three new trucks and a digger, and they wanted to see on this night shift how much this new digger could do. So I was one of the truckies and we were like racing pretty much, three girls, competition, let's go. And these two chicks, they just kept beating me. I'm like, how the, like I'm going as fast as I I can, you know. Anyway, I found out the next day that they weren't stopping at the stop sign on a hall Mm. road and I was, and that was the difference. And the reason I stopped at that stop sign is because, during the few days earlier, I nearly pulled out in front of a troopie full of my crew who were coming mm. back. Oh, they were heading off to crib and we'd done a hot seat. And I nearly pulled out. And if you're in a big truck with blind oh, blind spots yeah. everywhere and you're coming yeah. towards a road and the light vehicle's travelling with you, it was just in my blind spot in, in the big yeah. mirror on my offside. It was on my offside, my right-hand side. Yeah. So I... You know, I was at the quick stop, let's go. I'm like, shit, light vehicle. Really? And so that night I, I chose to stop, but they, they weren't. And I thought, bloody hell, you know, what if that had to happen? That's how yeah. things happen. So then I decided okay. bugger the racing and trying to win and be the best yeah. operator or whatever. You can do it you within know, the rules, <laughs> you know, make your yeah. time up backing in under the digger and at the, at the dump and stuff safely, but, yeah. You, you know, you make a really good point there, Mumsy. Uh, um, one of the things that I believe is for a lot of people, it takes something to happen to you before you will make any behavioural changes. Mm. You know, you, like you might have a near miss or you might even have a minor incident, you know, where you you, you get hurt. Um, for a lot of people, it takes, you know, you, someone to get hurt before they make any any changes. And... Um, they, they talk a lot about becoming complacent, doing the same yeah. job over and over again. Yeah. It's like, oh, I'm going to yep. write this shit down. And, you know, I'm going to fuel my truck yeah. up. Same bloody thing that I do every yeah. day. Like, um, And some of the sites I've been on, they joke if you roll the light vehicle quick, no one called the emergency until we've yeah. all done our slam, you know, take yeah. five, yeah. which is just ridiculous. But um if we'd have rolled it because we were all going in and it was shift change and we'd been parked up all night because it had been raining and we weren't allowed to drive anywhere pretty much. But when it was time Mm. to go home, we all did the wild drive to the gate in the troopies, you know. So Mm. if you take your time and did a slam and, right, we'll go slow, we'll do this, we'll make sure the the hubs are locked in for all drive or and all the things. So the complacency thing is what what I was getting at and I think that, having someone like yourself um, Mm -hmm. come in without them actually having to have an incident or a near miss themselves, that that can be a trigger and a reminder for them to go, oh, shit, shit does happen, which is why I do what I do because shit goes on out there. And, you know, you you make, I'm glad you've noticed that. That's what we believe we do is we give people the reason to stay safe. You know, because, you know, a a mining company or any workplace, they can provide training. They can provide systems and procedures and ways of doing things. But unless you give people a reason, they're just not going to use those things, you know. And and then by us going out, by me and, you know, the other people that I work with going out and sharing their stories, it gives people that, you know, that visible, tangible reason to use these systems, to use the training that they get. And that's my sister's, one of her biggest messages is always start with why. Why do I have to wear my bloody glasses? Why do I have to, you know, or why am I even here? You know? (laughs) So um, I would like to, I want to touch on how you started getting other people to speak as well. How did that start to unfold? Well, Again, it was it was pretty um, organic in that I've been doing the talk since uh, the late 90s, so, you know, for over 20 years. And um, 
I had people contact me and say, look, Woody, we really like what you do. And this is people who have been injured or had some sort of workplace incident. And they said, look, Woody, we really like what you do. How did you get into this? And how do we do the same thing? And, I mean, I'm, I'm fairly open and honest, mumsy, and, and I'd said, well, you know, this is how I started. I used to, I just shared how I got into it. But I think I was probably in a position to say, well, if you're interested in, in doing this sort of thing, why don't you come and, you know, maybe do some talks under my umbrella or, you know, work with, with me. And, you know, we've got, a, we've got uh, some two girls that work in the office uh, and my partner runs the business and they organise the, 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 you know, the travel, the, the how many sessions that we do and, you know, all the logistics behind it. And then she sends the, the rest of us out to actually visit the sites. And we've got a, you know, we've got a speaker that's probably been injured by most of them, you know, the common causes of people getting hurt. We've got one guy that got burnt because of an isolation breach. You know, we've got one one person that lost an arm uh, because of a, a guarding issue. Uh, we've got fatigue. We got you know um, stress and uh, uh, mental health, uh, and probably the the hardest story. Uh, to tell is one of our speakers goes out and shares a story about her 23 year old son getting killed at work. Mm. So she talks about it from a a parent's point of view of of losing a a family member. So, you know, they're, they're all personal. And again, you know, they all, they all hit home. There's no charts or statistics or, or anything like that up on a whiteboard. It's just, you know, a real person telling a real story and hopefully people can learn from our experiences. How did you, um, oh, whereabouts are you based now? Uh, I'm, I'm Victoria based, so I'm Melbourne based. Yep. Uh, but our speakers are based all over the country. We've yep. got one up in Queensland, we've got one over in WA, one in South Australia. Uh, a couple of us are here in, in Victoria. And, yeah, we just, we, we go anywhere. Yeah. Um, the reason I ask that is because, no doubt, you know about the eight deaths that we had up here yeah. in Queensland yeah. and that's yeah. been a huge thing for us yep. and for me personally and yeah. my sister, we've started a collaboration. We did the hashtag one minute for our lost minors yeah. because there was a lot going on at pre-starts or not going on. It was like the elephant in the room when people were going to work yeah. and they know that someone else had died or someone, someone else had died just down the road but they weren't allowed mm. to talk about it and yeah. and we have to wait until the incident has all been investigated and all yeah, the things, but they weren't even being acknowledged and our biggest point was address the elephant in the room and which sounds horrible when you're talking about someone who's passed away, but um, mm. just say we've heard old mate down the road, you've all heard about because everyone's at the crib hut on the buses you know, social media and the news and everything. Um, and then to get told at your pre-start when you bring it up, well, we know as much as you do. Now get out there and go to work. That's what actually yep. happened at one site. And um, I was furious, absolutely livid. Yep. And yep. Um, just to acknowledge that something has happened, we don't know why, we don't know all the ins and outs, but there's someone that hasn't gone home from work to their families and their friends Let's all head out. Let's make sure we do it safe. Come on, guys. We, you know, we at least use it isn't the right word. Like use it as a as a way to keep everyone safe, but acknowledge it because we really push mental yeah. health and talking about things. And to make everyone not talk about it was just horrible to us, and it yeah. really well, stirred us up a lot. Yeah, I, look, you make a good point there. I think some companies have got a lot of work to do as to how they deal with some of these things um i think the old days mumsy like 20 30 years ago it used to be almost accepted that you know because you worked in mining some of us were going to get killed or some of us were going to get hurt but we've come a long way since then you know we're at the point now where we don't have to hurt people and we definitely don't have to kill people but i think you know as you know some companies they don't do a really good job of of dealing with it after someone gets hurt Mm. Um, or someone gets killed. 
So I think they should, you know, I mean, they've got access to uh, all these, you know, wonderful professional people that can tell them the best way to deal with it. You know, a bit of communication, you know, just, just open communication, yet it still seems that as soon as someone gets hurt or someone gets killed, they they close shop and it all becomes a big, you know, secrecy thing. And I, I think a lot of it's got to do with um, maybe liability mm-hmm. and they, they're worried about who's going to be found liable for what happened and when in actual fact we're all people, we all we're all humans. We all need to know. That's right. And because um, I was contacted by the media and stuff and ended up on the radio and talking about it. And they saw it as exactly that. It's just this big secret thing that mm. no one's allowed to talk about. Yeah. Um, mm. And I didn't know any more than the media. You know, I only yeah. knew what they knew. Um, but we need to. The figures is what I was trying to get to is. To see, oh, eight deaths, six deaths, four deaths in six months, well, is that they were people who had families. Yeah. They weren't, it's yeah. not numbers and graphs and like you just yeah. said, you know, and so yeah. they they ended up doing that big safety reset. Were you involved yes. yeah. with any of that? Well, I, I was involved and I was a little bit disappointed with mm, it. I, and I'm going to be really, I'm going to be really honest with you here, Mumsy. Um I got asked to go to a couple of the sites. Uh, well, not so much. Let's not talk about the safety reset, but one of my biggest frustrations is I'll get asked to come out to a, a, a mine site after someone gets hurt or after someone gets killed. Mm. And I hate that. Yeah. That's too late then. You know, what, are you, what have you done prior to this happening? You know, why didn't you get me out six months ago or 12 months ago? What else have you done in the lead up to this? So I get really frustrated by people thinking, oh, yeah, something's happened, we'll get James out or we'll do this or we'll do that uh, to try and rectify it. When, you know, a lot of companies, they should be putting in the, the, the effort prior to someone getting hurt or, you know, to stop someone from getting hurt or getting killed. And the people that you're talking to after the fact know firsthand yeah. what can happen yeah. because... Someone just died on their site or... Yeah, yeah. exactly, on their, yeah. on their crew. Yeah, so yeah. it's a great message to... Um, and I've been to a couple of talks where people have come out similar to yourself and um, with a message, whatever it be, and it really sticks for a while with the crew. Yeah. yeah. And then yeah. it goes away, you know, and then um, yeah. everyone's doing the old thing that... Yeah. That talk was meant to stop us doing. Uh, oh, yeah. So we always, yeah. it's like, what's another analogy? Like a diet. We all know how to lose weight. You know, oh, move yeah. more, yeah. eat less, be healthy. Oh, yeah. We all know how to put it back on. I again. know. <laughs> yeah. Drink beer. That'll do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, but we've just found a new thing that yeah. reminds our brain how to do it what to do, oh, yeah, but you know it, but this person's telling me in a way that's sinking in. And I think when it comes to safety, we all need constant reminders. Every couple of months, something like that needs to be coming through. They have to make time because they lose production, don't they, when there's 10 or 20 people, okay, your turn, (laughs) like cattle in you go, sign off, you've done your thing. (laughs) Get back here by the hot seat, right? Get Make sure you're back out here to hot seat, second grip. <laughs> and we all go, oh, ask lots of questions, ask lots of questions. <laughs> one, of the, one of the really good things that, that I've also had the experience of is working with companies that do do that. You know, I've, I've got a couple of clients that, you know, have even I think it was earlier this year, it was start back to work this year, um, they rang me and they said, look, James, can you send one of your, you know, one of your people out? And I said, oh, okay, yep. And he says, we've had, oh, it was 2,400 days LTI free. Wow. And he said, look, we've had, we've had a really good run over the last, you know, four or five years. We just want to keep it going. We want to make sure we do everything we can to make sure that no one gets hurt. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's the, the whole opposite of what we just talked about. You know, is it, there are some businesses and some companies that are, are proactive in, you know, training and, you know, providing the information for their employees and there's other companies that just don't do that. 
Yeah. And um, that's that's a really good point. Uh, proactive was the exact word that was coming in yeah. into me into my brain when yep. you when you were saying that. That's what all workplaces. And so, do you go to other sites other than just mine sites? Because this is basically yeah, a message absolutely. for life, isn't it? Not yeah. just well, choices. at work yeah. online. I mean, choices is pretty, uh, you know, it's pretty generic. So it, it applies to everybody. So I've, I've worked for some crazy companies. I mean, mines, mm-hmm. you know, mines, construction, uh, but, you know, uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, manufacturing, um, it, 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 office workers. I mean, you know, people that work in an office, you, you, you might think that an office is a fairly low risk area. But I, I use the example of a, a girl that I know that is, it gets around like me in a wheelchair in that uh, one day she had to get a, a, a file or a box of files off the top of a, a cabinet. So rather than going at a, getting a, a ladder or the right sort of, you know, equipment, she stood on a chair that had wheels on it and mm. the chair slipped out from underneath her and she hit her head on the desk on the way down and broke her neck. Shit. So, you know, we've all got choices, Mumsy. Mm. And... Just changing tact a little bit, I love the videos that you have on your website. Oh, yeah. Uh, Woody's, Woody's, Woody's words. words. Oh, yeah. yes. I've watched a few of those. And I guess by this example, it will give the listeners an idea of. So you record the little videos when you're travelling around quite yep. a bit just you know um on your phone i'm assuming nothing too high tech yeah. or anything but they work good yeah. job tech yeah. techno side of me i'm, I'm liking that you're doing very well <laughs> but like the yeah. for instance the one you're in a hotel room and because yeah. you stay in a lot of hotels and there's lots of um uh, there's room for you in your wheelchair to go in the shower there was handrails at the toilet everything was great and then you said but look where the towels are I pissed yeah. myself laughing and then I felt bad for laughing at you. Oh, uh, that's ridiculous. Who the fuck could put them up there? I wouldn't yeah. even reach them when I can stand up. That was You couldn't reach them. That's yeah, they're up, up on a high shelf. Yeah. And that, that's that's the thing, and that's what I try and do mm-hmm. because until you know, until something like this happens to you or someone close to you, you got no idea about some of the shit that's involved. You know, little things that I can't reach the towels, you know, I can't get to some places. One one of my biggest frustrations is that a hotel or a you know some sort of accommodation place will say yes we've got a wheelchair friendly room, and it's just not you know they've got no idea. I, I, I get I get pretty frustrated by that. So then I just do a little video and say right, bugger you. <laughs> so you feel you're also becoming a bit of a voice, a bit of a advocate for disability what am I trying to say, to get um, businesses and places like that, councils like footpaths and all sorts mm-hmm. of things to um, be more aware and to do something about it? Do you, have you seen it change you know, over the years, I guess, is the question? Yeah, the question is I have seen it change over the years. I mean, you know, uh, nearly 30 years ago when I first got hurt, um, the little country town that I grew up in, they didn't even have the little cutouts in, in footpaths. I had to push my wheelchair along the side of the road because I just couldn't get up onto the footpath. Oh, so they so, only you know, had gutters, that's all. Yeah, they only had gutters, yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's, you know, that's that's when we first started putting those little cutouts in, in footpaths, you know, mm. 20, 30 years ago. And and since then, you know, things have slowly progressed where, you know, I, I reckon it's pretty good these days. There's, there's not too many places that I can't get to. Um, and I'm pretty determined too, Mumsy. If you put a beer at the top of a set of stairs, I'll get there, You'll get guaranteed. There. <laughs> Give me a call, I'll help you out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unless it's a but VB, it's not... I don't know. No. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I don't know. Uh, VB and 4X, you can have them. Oh, see, I like hey, um, the, the other, The other part of your question, uh, am I trying to be an advocate? I'm not. I don't, I've got no plans of being any sort of advocate for disability issues. I just want people to understand that when something like this happens to you, it just changes everything for you. You know, like I, you, you got no idea some of the, the frustration that I've experienced since I got hurt. 
You know, imagine if you, you, you wanted to go somewhere by yourself. You know, sometimes we just like to do our own thing. You know, imagine if you wanted to go somewhere by yourself and when you got to where you were going, there was like four or five steps out the front or, you know, there was no ramp or no lift access. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of little things like that that really piss me off and I, I do like to just share them with people because unless, you know, it impacts on you or the people around you, you got no idea. So I'll I'm keep sharing my Woody's words. Yes, Woody's words, everyone. You've got to check it out. They're gold. And um, I'm actually a disability support worker now. Yeah, part, okay. Yep. Part time, a few hours a week, right. you know, in between talking to wonderful people like you yeah. about mining. And so I always kind of joke that I'm paid to be nice now instead of being told to harden the fuck yeah. up, you know. <laughs> yeah. And um, so, yeah, I really notice things like that. You know, I yeah. had to learn how to push someone in a wheelchair and I was like, do yeah. we go forward? Lucky she could talk yeah. me through it, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. Do we go you, forward you or know, backwards? Oh, I don't know. It's a bit yeah. steep. Or, geez, this is a bit bloody steep. This is ridiculous, mm. this ramp, you know. Um, so, yeah, I really looked mm. at those videos with those sort of eyes as well. Yeah. You know, that's that's the other part of what I enjoy about what I do, Mumsy, is a lot of, as, as you know, a lot of the guys and the girls that work in mining, they're, they're, you know, they're different types of characters and, and many of them have never even met someone in a wheelchair or mm. someone with any sort of disability. So by me turning up at a site, you know, and, and I'll be honest with you, I frequent the wet mess quite a bit when I'm at a, at a mine site. You know, I, I'll go up and have a beer and it gives them the opportunity to, you know, to speak to someone that they've probably never had the opportunity to speak to before. And, you know, they, they ask questions, you know, they ask, they say, well, how do you drive a car? You know, how do you, you know, get upstairs? Um, how do you, can you have sex? That's a fairly common one. <laughs> it's so, it, yeah. yeah. Have you seen that show on Channel 2? I think it's about to start again. You can't ask that. Yes. You that's can't ask gold. that. That's yeah. gold, that. So that's, in a way, that's, you know, that's something that I'm providing, you know, I'm providing that opportunity for some of these people to ask me the questions that they've always wanted to ask. Yeah, yeah. And over a few beers. Over sometimes. a few beers. <laughs> at, the, yeah. at the pub, uh, at the wet mess. For those of you who don't know what the wet mess is, that's the bar at the camp. The dry mess is, you know, oh, I suppose I better go and have something to eat <laughs> and then come yeah. back to the bar. <laughs> it's only when the wet mess shuts. <laughs> yeah, because some camps do that. I haven't stayed any, well, tell a lie I have, but we bought enough takeaways to get us through while yeah, they shut the bar through. for an hour while you're meant to all herd in like cattle. To force people to go and have something to eat. Yeah. And the beer was so cheap. It was like two or three yes. bucks a can. Yeah. That was a while ago, though. So just before we leave this part of the um, interview, and we'll go on to some other lighter questions about, you know, like have you got any steel cap boot stories? <laughs> have you had any spiders <laughs> in your boots? <laughs> um, I wanted to leave the listeners with reading from your website, cnbsafe.com.au, what we do, because I found it really powerful message. Um, okay. Okay. See and be safe is a group of people that have experienced firsthand workplace injury or fatality. We share our stories to try and show workplaces and management groups the real impact that workplace incidents can have and the reason that we must all be involved in safety. Our stories bring reality to all of the effort and resources that a business puts into safety. Most people need a reason to use the training and systems and procedures that you put in place. Our safety speakers give them that reason by showing and explaining how their workplace accidents changed their lives and affected many of the people around them. The stories we tell are not about statistics or procedures. They are real-life messages on how getting hurt or killed while doing your job will change your life. And that really blew me away. That's, um, mm. in a nutshell, exactly what you're doing. So yeah. good on you for helping people in the world. Because Thanks, Mumsy. Now for a word from our sponsor, 
Julia Hartman and the Bantax Accounting Group. Julia is my awesome accountant. She's written two books with financial expert Noel Whitaker, and she's got a passion to help us miners make the most out of our hard-earned cash. She's got heaps of tips and make sure that we get every cent we are meant to get and is right on the ball with everything. If you head to bantax.com.au forward slash miners, that's B-A-N-T-A-C-S, you can download a free booklet all just for us miners. And there's also a spreadsheet in there that helps you check off what tools you have for your trade, like your isolation lock, work boots, seven shirts, all of these sorts of things, and you can weigh them up and it'll tell you if you qualify weight-wise to claim your trips out to work. And that's just one of the things that they've got over there. So I strongly urge you to head to bantax.com.au forward slash miners and see what they can do and find your nearest office as we come up to tax time. They're really on the ball, know what's going on with the tax department and there's heaps of other free information like property investing. If you really plan on doing some great things with your money, you want to do that, right? If you want to sell your house, you can save a lot of money if you find out what to do first rather than in hindsight. And Julia, she'll, you know, make sure you get it right. And if you do it wrong, and then go and see her, she'll, she'll up you in the nicest possible way because she really cares about us and wants us to keep our money and not give it to the tax department. Anyway, head over to bantax.com.au forward slash miners and tell them Mad Mumsy sent you. So we can end up with quite a few old shirts and old pants yeah. and old boots and stuff. So the question is... What do you do with your old PPE and do you wear it when you're not on mine site? Um, I wear it when I'm working on my old cars um, and when I've got too much of it, uh, I give it to, I've got two adult sons, so they, uh, they fit into my shirts, so they, uh, they get all dead secondhand shirts. <laughs> yeah. Do they wear them mowing the lawn and going fishing and yes. stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's funny because I mean I'm Woody because my surname's Wood, so they're all Woodies as well. So we we've there's been one time in particular where there's been three of us and we've all we've all had Woody shirts on. <laughs> That's gold, isn't it? And you see a lot of places so, uh, nowadays don't let you have nicknames on your shirt. You have yes, to have a yeah, full name. Yes. It's got to be your proper name. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. That's something I share with my newbies. <laughs> um, and if you are allowed to have your nickname and you're the only one walking around with Leanne Drew on there, <laughs> you, you can look silly too. So find yeah. out if you get a chance. Um, and what about your steel cap boots? Have you got any stories around your boots from over the years? Not, not, not really. Uh, my biggest issue with steel cap boots or any or belts is airports mm. as you can imagine mm. i do a fair bit of traveling and most airports are pretty good they they'll just wave the hand scanner over my my boots and across my waist you know just to pick up on any metal but you know i i've i've had a few occasions where they said nut nah, boots off belt off and i've gone mm. oh, really mate do i have to but they're just doing their job. so Following yeah. procedure. <laughs> Following procedure. So you can take your own boots off and put it's, your own yeah. belt on and off and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no problems at all. Because that would be difficult for someone who couldn't. They yeah. have to get the um, security guy to say, all right, then, well, if you take them off. Yeah. You, <laughs> you want them off, off you, you take them off, mate. Yeah. <laughs> I might try. I might try that one. Try next that time. when you can't. When you just having one of those can't be bothered moments. Think of yeah. Mad Mumsy and let me know how it I goes. Might, I might actually film it too. <laughs> yes, tag me, tag me, tag me. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what about your old hard hats? Do you keep those? Still got it. Those, you probably can't see it from there, but the hat that I was wearing uh, the day that I had my accident is just where my finger is there. Oh, I see it. Yeah. <laughs> On the it's shelf a green hard there. hat, yeah, and uh, it's got Woody across the top. Mm. In, uh, in a, it was a sticker, I think, at the time. But uh, so, yeah. when you did have your accident, did it just fly off your head? 
Yeah, I don't think I was. I think I was probably wearing it in the truck, but I just don't know where. Yeah, where it ended it, up. It yeah. Brought, that, that that mate that brought my take five books down, he brought my hard hat down as well. So oh. And I've obviously gathered it from the the accident site. Yeah, from the site. So when back in the day when you were doing night shift, mm. your big seven hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a big night shift. Yeah. Uh, how did you find sleeping during the day? Do you have any yeah. tips for people about in general, fatigue or um, how you yeah. handle? Uh, I, I, I don't have any tips. I, I do have an opinion on rotating shifts in that it's just not normal. It's really difficult for some people to cope with, you know, one week of day shift, one week of night shift and try and maintain any sort of normal quality of life. And that's my personal opinion. I've never been able to cope with it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I like, you know, the the constancy of, you know, sleep during the night and work during the day. I like it. That's right. And beer o'clock is the sun beer still o'clock, out. Beer o'clock. Yeah, beer o'clock's after work no matter what that is. That's it. <laughs> or sometimes, well, you know, this is during work. I'm just having my token yeah. one beer with my, it's called beers Perfect. with a minor after all. <laughs> yeah. And what about when it comes to the perception of being a rich miner? Do you have anything, any words of wisdom about money or anything that um, over the years you've learned or anything you'd like to share about that? Uh, look, I, I believe that, you know, if you work hard, you're entitled to uh, a decent amount of pay. And I also believe that, you know, if you're working in conditions that are worse than other conditions, you should be paid more than if you were, you know, working in those those not so bad conditions. So, Mumsy, I've been to remote area mines in the Pilbara, the Kimberley, you know, off the coast of Darwin, where it's pretty harsh, you know. And as much as the camps have changed a lot over the 20 years uh, or 30 years, um, it's still remote area mining. So I believe that, you know, if you're working in that environment uh, or in any mining environment, you know, you are entitled to a little bit more as by way of compensation or by way of pay than if you're working in town with all the conveniences and all the, you know, the, the bells and whistles. And a bed where you're home every night at your own home uh-huh. as well. Yeah. Well, because yeah. a lot of places will pay, what do they call it, remote allowance? Yep. But I guess not all places do. Um, and then there's the whole contractor yeah, next to yeah, the permanent. Yeah. That's another. We we'll be here all day if we start talking. Yeah. yeah, it is, and I have spoken about it a few times. Um, yeah. And over the years, okay, when you were working or when you were working in the mines, were there any women or many? Yeah, we we had we had two women on the actually two women on the whole mine site that were actually working in operational roles. One was a grader driver. And one was uh, just pretty much an all rounder. Yep. Um, and uh, it was it was it was probably pretty tough for them. Uh, I can remember there was no female uh, bathrooms or change facilities uh, on the actual you know in any of the workshops or any of the crib rooms. Uh, they had to use uh, there was a an admin building at the you know the entrance to the site, and they had to use the the female facilities and, and change rooms in the admin building. So, you know, it was was a, a little bit, uh, it would have been a little bit tough back in the 80s and the 90s. Yeah, it was. Um, my mum, well, and my sister, that's when she started out there too. So, mm-hmm. uh, yes, lots of stories around that from those two, mm-hmm. pioneers in mining for women for yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what about nowadays when you travel out to site? So you, you would be seeing an increase in the number of women out yeah, there when you're doing absolutely. your talks and at camp and yeah and look I, I i love it i love the fact that women have got into most industries uh but in particular mining because uh, over the years it has been a fairly male dominated industry um and i think that's that's led to some fairly uh dangerous attitudes you know i mean you mentioned before harden the fuck up you know the 
the old, uh, you know, if if you don't fit in, fuck off, off yeah. sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that's that's whereas, what a lot of people call the acronym for FIFO. Yeah. Fit in or yeah. fuck off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But you know, this this is probably something that I'd I'd like to mention, Mumsy. Having worked with mining for you know most of my life. I think we have probably got some people in the industry that are not suited to it. Um, back when the boom happened in, I don't know, the, the, the 2000s, early 2000s, um, you know, you had school teachers that were giving up, you know, school teaching just to go and work in mining purely for the money. Mm. And they just are not suited to the industry. Um, and I think there's a lot of those people that are still in the industry that really just don't get it. They don't, you know, they're not they're not suited to mining and they just don't and they probably never will get it. And I know there'll be a lot of my listeners going, yep, and I've got one of them on my crew. Yeah. And it could be a bloke as well. There's some, yeah, I've well, come yeah, across no, a few blokes in my day that are just like no, that. No, I wasn't, I wasn't alluding to women there. I was alluding to people, people in general yes. in, in mining. Yeah, people in general. Uh, there are some people in general in mining at the moment that are not suited to the industry. And, you know, that's, that's yeah, that's a bit of a worry for me. And I'm sure you also aren't targeting school teachers either because I have come across some no, school no, teachers who end up freaking awesome trainers. No, <laughs> no yeah. Yeah, but I, I understand your example. I could just hear my school teacher people going, what? <laughs> I'm great. Yeah. <laughs> um, but what it does do, Woody, and I'm glad that you brought it up, is point out that mining isn't for everyone, but why not? What does it take to thrive and survive in this industry? Which exactly. is the intro to my podcast. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's why I do what I do. Um, and it's important to have a why, which again brings us yep. right back to everything we just spoke about I think you know why are we at work why do we do what I do we you know why do I do what I do why do you yeah um and for you at home or in your truck on your grader in the plane if you're allowed to fly at the moment (laughs) or wherever you are when you're listening use this opportunity to think about your why you're about to go and do what you're doing or you might actually be doing it and um Think of Woody's message about choices and how you can stay safe and make sure you get home to your family and friends or your dog or your garden or whatever you've got that you want to go home to. (laughs) This is my last question, Woody. (laughs) So finally, what is your special place, Woody, when life turns to shit? How do you personally handle the tough times? What are your strategies to hang in there day to day? I'd have to say my shed. Your shed? I, uh, oh, I love it. <laughs> I'm I'm actually sitting in my shed at the moment talking to you. So it's my go-to place. Uh, you know, whenever I need a, a bit of, you know, just reflection time, time to think, time to just chill out. If I've had a shit day, I'll come down the shed. Uh, uh, I've got a dog and, you know, you give me my dog and my shed and it just sort of, calms everything down oh i so love it i love yeah. it i've seen your dog wandering around in the background yeah yeah he? yeah he's in the background there what sort of dog is he he's a border collie yeah he looks like a big dog where is he come and say oh, hello. He's, he's fairly big yeah he's uh... <laughs> um so is your man cave then Go yeah on. well it's a man cave i i don't like to call it a man cave i call it a shed, a shed. but it's uh yeah, it. it's got everything i need it's got a tv it's got a fridge full of beer. Full of beer. We should, we, we should have got one out for you. Yeah, yeah. It's that time of day. Oh, I'm that's, just gonna, that's I'm going to crack one as soon as I finish here. Yeah, and I'll go crack another one and I can't wait to listen to this back. In closing, do you have anything that you're super excited about right now that you'd like to share with us? Not really, Mumsy. I'm a bit concerned like everybody else about the... Uh, the coronavirus that's happening to us all. Mm. Um, I'm pretty positive about the future, though. I think this is something that we we all have to, you know, work together to get through. Um, I'm looking forward to, you know, once this all blows over, or when it all blows over, getting back out to doing what I do and visiting 
mine sites and workplaces and trying to show people that uh, safety is not just about covering the boss's backside. It's about us going home to the people and the things that we all want to go home to. Yes, and this coronavirus effort that the world is going through at the moment seems to be connecting on such a global level. It's, you know, we're all going through it in various ways and people like yourself, you can't go out to site and do your normal Mm. presentations and workshops, but what that has done is given us a window of opportunity to finally sit down over exactly. Zoom and do our our conference call. So we've got to love social media and the internet at we the do. moment. Thank goodness for that. And the world is even having a bit of a cleanse. I heard that the, yeah. the canals in Venice yeah. uh, are clearing yeah. and... Skies over China. I, yes, blue skies yeah. in China. So, yeah. you know, we just needed to all have a deep breath. But it's not taking away either from the seriousness of it because, um, you know, people are sick and dying and losing jobs and all sorts of things. So, Mm -hmm. um, but all we can do is try to stay safe and look after each other and stay connected. So, and see what, what comes next really, you know, and keep believing, like you say, keep believing that it'll all work out. Yep. So what is the best way for people to get in touch with you, Woody, if perhaps um, someone wants to get you to come? That sounds like I'll get you. <laughs> we'll get Woody. Get Woody to come out to site or if they'd just like to drop in and say hello. Not to well, your shed, to you. <laughs> no, you. Oh, look, you're more than welcome at my shed. The beer's always cold mm. and the fridge is always full. <laughs> um, the best way to get to me, Mumsy, is by my website, C and B safe, so it's C for cat, N for November, B for Bob, and then the word safe.com.au. Or just, I think uh, I've got a fairly good Google rating, so just type James Wood safety into Google and I usually pop up somewhere. Awesome. Thanks. Now I know the keywords when I <laughs> when I share this. Thing. Um, thanks so much for that, Woody. It's time to say goodbye now. We could chat all day and I have been known to. Remember, all the links we discussed in this episode can be found at madmumsy.com forward slash beers 69. Interesting number. (laughs) Okay, don't hang up. We finish the interview, but that's that's that. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, well done. Thank you. Thank you. No, that's great. Thank you. We finally got it done. We did. Awesome. Thanks. I'm uh, going to send Drew a message now and saying, just got off the phone to your sister. <laughs> yes, be sure to. She's actually, I've got messages from everyone. What is going yes, on? Yes, oh, well, my phone's yes. been going up. Hopefully the world's not gone to crap. Okay, thank All you. All right, I'll catch up soon. Yeah, will do. See ya. Bye. Go and enjoy that beer. I will. Don't you worry. <laughs> Bye. My fridge, is, my fridge is not far away. Oh, <laughs> see you later, mate. Bye. Bye. Well, how was that? Powerful or what? (laughs) Imagine how much energy would be oozing into your crew when he's in the room. It gives me goosebumps just thinking about it, I'll tell you. Be sure to reach out to Woody about him or one of his CBN safe speakers coming to your site and tell him Mad Mumsy sent you. Remember, it doesn't have to be mining either. His safety message is important in any home or workplace. All the links we spoke about, including how to get in touch with Woody, can be found at madmumsy.com forward slash beers 69. The number is 69. (laughs) Oh, and wash your hands and stay at home. We're still in that mode as I record this toward the end of April 2020 and it would be remiss Hmm. not sure about that word but I just feel like I need to say something and it's really good news at the moment that our curve seems to be flattening and restrictions may start to be eased soon finally a light at the end of the tunnel and it's not another fucking train I heard that years ago and It's quite interesting, isn't it? You know, they always say, look for the light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, the person that kept telling me said, yeah, it's another fucking train. So in this case, it's not. 
restrictions hopefully start being eased off and if we all keep doing the right things, we'll beat this COVID little mongrel. Keep looking for the good bits between the shit bits, my peeps. And as my sister, Hard Hat Mentor, always says, this too shall pass. Until next time, stay safe, be real, be special and have fun. For we only live once. Cheers. Wash your hands. Stay home. Wash your hands. Stay home. Stay in your bubble. Social distancing. Oh. <laughs> you clown. Okay. Cheers.